Good morning and welcome to CSIS. Thank you for braving the snow and to, joining, uh, to those joining us in person and to those joining us online. I am Lana Beda, Senior Fellow with the Human Rights Initiative at CSIS. We are delighted to launch CSIS report Counterterrorism Measures and Civil Society, Changing the Will, Finding the Way. This report is a publication of CSIS International Consortium on Closing Civic Space. After the devastating 9-11 attacks, uh, and in response to the international community calls to fight terrorism in pursuant to the United Nations Security Council resolutions and to the United Nations General, um, General Assembly uh, Global Counterterrorism Strategy, over 140 governments have passed counterterrorism laws and measures. Despite the urgency of the objective, the implementation of counterterrorism legislation has been used as a pretext to curtail fundamental human rights and freedoms. As the new measures in continue and intensify, the space for civil society shrinks. Human rights lawyers, journalists, activists, trade unionists, protesters, and even children have come been convicted of terrorism and condemned to life imprisonment and, or even to death. This is in spite of the widely recognized role that civil society plays in combating terrorism and counter-violent extremism. We are honored to be joined by Fanola Nyeireen, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while countering terrorism to launch this report. Fanola took up her function as the UN Special Rapporteur in August 2017. She's a university regent professor at the University of Minnesota, holder of the Rubina Chair in Law, Public Policy and Society, and faculty director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Minnesota Law School. Previously, Fanola held many positions with the United Nations. She was a representative of the prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at domestic war crimes trials in Bosnia in 1996. In 2003, she was appointed by the UN Secretary General of the United Nations, of the UN Secretary General as a special expert on promoting gender equality in times of conflict and peacemaking. Please join me in welcoming Fanola to the podium for her keynote speech. Thank you all. I'm really delighted to be here and uh, delighted that you braved the snow. I was traveling in from Minnesota last night where snow does not stop anything, but I wasn't sure that was true in Washington, so it's very great to be here. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of launching this important report, and um, this gathering gives me the opportunity to under underscore the preoccupation with and the value that should be given to the protection of civil society in the context of counterterrorism in my role as UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism. In my very first report last October to the United Nations General Assembly, uh, I laid out four priorities for my mandate. I have a three-year appointment. And in, that, in those priorities, the protection of civil society from the adverse effects of counterterrorism was foremost. Um, as the UN General Assembly itself noted in 2006 when it adopted the Global Counterterrorism Strategy, effective counterterrorism measures and the protection of human rights are not conflicting goals, but they're fundamentally complementary and mutually reinforcing. It's clear that in advancing and protecting human rights in any society, civil society is itself a necessary and much needed infrastructure. Uh, civil society paves the way for more effective prevention strategies, both with regard to the attractiveness of recourse to terrorist action and the attraction of radical or violent extremism. Civil society's engagement brings consistent attention to upholding the rule of law, engaging human rights values, protecting the most marginalized and vulnerable, and often speaking on behalf of those who will be the target of counterterrorism measures 
individuals and group who are sometimes the most reviled and most excluded because of their views or the perceived threat they pose. But their humanity is equally demanded, uh, their humanity equally demands protection and, and recognition uh, under a rule of law based society. It's also clear that when civil society organizations give voice to marginalized and vulnerable individuals, including victims of terrorism, they are the carriers or the, the entry points to accountability and transparency in counterterrorism work. And so civil society has this critical role to play in education, activism, research, outreach, and partnership with government in the context of terrorism. Civil society is not the enemy. The independence of civil society is critical to this value and the voice that civil society holds. And I have consistently affirmed in the mandate over the past uh, year the value of civic space, public participation, and critical engagement by civil society as an essential part of a human rights informed approach to counterterrorism. These values that are central to that, association, assembly, expression, these are all key elements of the human rights treaty ar architecture. And they have an intrinsic value, but they also promote the functionality of societies in which the dignity and respect of each human person is advanced, and that is the kind of society in which violence does not take root. But as many of you in this room know, and as this report so eloquently documents, civil society space is shrinking and is under sustained pressure in many parts of the globe. And the data that underpins this report really affirms that uh, observation. Human rights defenders are at the front line of that shrinking space and are targeted both by state and non-state actors alike. So they're like right squeezed in the middle. Um, my mandate since taking up this office, we've intervened in a number of cases involving the use and what I have viewed as the abuse of counterterrorism legislation against civil society actors. These in interventions have included, um, I'm just going to mention a few communications, this is a good week to say this, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia um, in its use of counterterrorism legislation to charge, convict, and subject to execution persons who are accused of spreading the Shia faith in the kingdom under counterterrorism legislation. Communications with Turkey regarding its counterterrorism and emergency laws that have been used to target and detain uh, hundreds of civil society activists, but specifically the one case we've recently intervened on is the case of the detention of the chair of Amnesty International by Turkey, Tanya Kilik. We've communicated with Egypt who have charged terrorism offenses against persons whom I and a number of special rapporteurs view as civil society activists. So across the globe, from Ethiopia to Pakistan, where we see the use of counterterrorism uh, norms as a way to shortcut regular process of law, counterterrorism practice is gaining pace and traction in ways that are deeply challenging to the rule of law and the maintenance of human rights protections. So let me identify a couple of trends and practices that I see in the deployment of counterterrorism. First and foremost, I think we all have to understand, and this is laid out in the, in the foreword or the introduction to the report that's being launched today. Uh, the global practice of counterterrorism norms should be understood as precisely that, a global and internationalized phenomenon. Uh, this has led me to describe what I see as an emer the emergence of a globalized security regime post 9-11. And that globalized security regime is having enormous and outsized effect on other legal regimes, including human rights and the law of armed conflict. When we talk about the justification for human rights, uh, for, the, for counterterrorism norms, that justification doesn't lie in national legal systems alone. It lies in the counterterrorism structure that was birthed by a particular Security Council resolution, 1373, passed in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And that from that starting resolution, we've had a series of other resolutions, including most recently uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2396 on foreign fighters, that essentially create an architecture of legal norms at the UN 
Now, that legal architecture requires states to promulgate counterterrorism norms. So the impetus is not just an internal domestic impetus, it's this global impetus or requirement for states to uh, create these norms. And what's interesting is at the beginning of this process, many states said, we don't need those norms. We don't have a counterterrorism problem, or we think our ordinary law is sufficient to cope with this problem. But the, in fact, the, the requirement of this, re, of this structure is to produce the norms, whether you think you need them or not. And the key point here is that the international sort of promulgation or focal point of those norms then creates the legitimacy for states to go on and legislate domestically. So let me now turn to legislative um, enactments at the domestic level. So once you have this presumption of necessity uh, that has sort of moved from the UN Security Council Resolution 1373, what we find is that national and ultimately self-interested and fundamentally unregulated definitions of terrorism triumph. What we are seeing as a sort of an epidemic across the globe, and really there's no other way to describe it, is an epidemic of loose, vague, and highly problematic definitions of terrorism. And that sort of capture is also found in this study today as, it, as these five case studies reveal. And so in that matrix, what we find is self-serving definitions of th terrorism pervading and, and, uh, and, and making their way into national definitions. And so the result is, in practice, that the term terrorist or extremist is increasingly defined in many countries as those who simply dissent, those who disagree, those who offer oppositional views, those who challenge the purity or ethnic composition of the state, or those who simply do not fit in with prevailing political discourses uh, and are then ousted as excluded uh, from the protection of the state. And so it is this challenge of definition that lies at the heart of the problem of the targeting of civil society activists. Um, and on this point, what I would want to underscore is that there is a comfortable consensus by states that no one state will criticize another state on its domestic definition of terrorism. And so what we find is even as states engage in what are understood to be highly problematic definitions, the, we find the actualization of an old and very dangerous principle in political life, which is you scratch my back and I scratch yours, and we're not going to talk about the, the context that gives rise to that. So what does that give rise to? Well, at the national level, what we are seeing increasingly is terrorism definitions and practice being applied to speech acts of various kinds. What we see is terrorism definitions and practices increasingly being applied to what we might call the pre-criminal space. So not even at the point of action, but at the point of thought or presumed thought. What we find is terrorist definitions and practice infecting the ordinary law of of the land, with the result of endemic practices of emergency, meaning counterterrorism law becomes the norm of law in many states. And in my most recent report to the Human Rights Council in March, I focus in on this particular problem of counterterrorism legislation and practice as this particular species of emergency practice which, as many of us in the room will know, emergencies have a consistent and high correlation with systematic human rights violations. What we see, as evidenced in the report, is the restriction of due process rights, the resort to exceptional courts, the imposition of severe and often disproportionate penalties for security offenses on definitions of, of action that are problematic to start with. In parallel, we are also seeing counterterrorism regimes involve the targeting of particular communities and groups, giving rise to assumptions about what we might call suspect, the suspect nature of particular communities and individuals, and essentially uh, institutionalizing structural discrimination and exclusions in many societies. And as this report amply demonstrates today, what we see is a widespread crackdown on human rights defenders and civil society activists under the guise of terrorism. 
In a notable irony, I should say, states are then reporting their statistics on terrorism crackdown or terrorism prosecution as demonstrating to the global counterterrorism architecture how effective they are in cracking down on terrorism. So spot the irony or the paradox in that. And so they are then commended by the global counterterrorism structure for their good practice of engaging robustly with terrorism. But let's closely, as this report does, examine precisely the practices that are giving rise to those statistics for states. The irony is compelling. This pattern, I think, should concern us all, this sort of matrix of, of consequences that follow both from the global counterterrorism architecture and the domestic definitions of terrorism. But they should also directly concern states who are genuinely committed to addressing the scourge of terrorism and the violence and insecurity that pervades many society. There is little doubt, as a slew of so good social science evidence demonstrates, that human rights violations are at the heart of the conditions conducive to the production of terrorism and the rationales that produce politically motivated violence in the first place. So the irony again here is that as states say they want to prevent terrorism, these actions in fact do precisely the opposite. They, we, we know empirically that what these actions do is create alienation, anomie, and the fertile ground within which the conditions to, ter to terrorism thrive. Uh, taking seriously the notion that in order to prevent violence or terrorism, we need to engage all of society. This is a mantra that's used often within the UN system. Civil society is then a crucial partner in the counterterrorism regime. Cracking down on civil society is not only unethical and a violation of a state's human rights treaty obligations and customary international law, but it is fundamentally counterproductive and inefficient. Because if the longer and broader goal is to prevent violence and undercut the conditions that produce that violence, then you have to create societies in which people uh, and communities thrive. I close by saying that even as civil society is criticizing government, even as it is exercising those rights, they are doing the necessary work of transpar trans transparency and accountability that is so essential to a healthy, functional, rule of law based society. I remain deeply concerned in my role as Special Rapporteur that civil society groups are being targeted by national security laws and administrative procedures for engaging in legitimate activities that are protected by international human rights law. The harassment, suppression, detention, and killing of civil society activists, lawyers, human rights defenders cannot be accepted and legitimized by a reliance on national security excuses or doctrines. And we have, I think, a unique opportunity in the next couple of months as uh, states uh, rewrite the global counterterrorism strategy uh, with a view to adopting a new strategy in June 26, 2018 to underscore the importance of human rights and the fourth pillar of the global strategy for human rights protection. And so as I close, one of the reasons why this report is particularly welcome for me is that it provides the kind of evidence basis to demonstrate the patterns in state practice and to empirically show the practices and costs of targeting civil society actors. My own experiences of de dealing with governments more or less on a daily basis is that they viewed the discussion of civil society crackdowns as anecdotal, a couple of bad apples here and there, and not indicative of structural challenges that are enabled by the very basis of the global counterterrorism architecture and its reward system for states. So this timely report gives concrete and much needed data to my observations, and I think provides a firm basis not only for engagement with individual states, but with the broader structure and incentive structure of the global counterterrorism architecture, and prompts a much needed and broader conversation on how things ought to be done differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanola, for your insight. You underscore the importance of the protection of civil society in efforts to counter terrorism.
and on the need for greater clarity with respect to the relationship of a human right to the emergence of international security regime regulating terrorism and counterterrorism, and of course the, uh, the protection of a human right and civil society and effective counterterrorism measures are mutually reinforcing and complementary. The coming hour will, will be dedicated to a panel discussion where we will discuss the main findings and recommendation of CSIS report and analyze the impact of counterterrorism uh, efforts on civic space in various contexts. We are delighted to have this discussion moderated by Douglas Rutson, President and CEO of the International Center for Not-for-Profit not for Law, ICNL, under Doug uh, uh, leadership, ICL, L, ICNL leadership uh, receive a MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. Doug is a member of Interactions Board of Director and serves on USAID Advisory Committee on Voluntary Foreign Aid. He also co-chaired the Civil Society Pillar of the Community of Democracies and the State Department Global Philanthropy Working Group. Doug teaches at Georgetown University Law Center and serves on the advisory board of the United Nations Democracy Fund. Doug and I will be joined by our distinguished panelists, Fanola, Shannon Green, and Andrea Prasso. Before I turn it over to Doug, I want to briefly introduce Shannon and Andrea. Shannon Green is the senior director of programs at the Center for Civilian in Conflict, CIVIC. Shannon was previously the Director and Senior Fellow of the Human Rights Initiative here at CSIS, where her research focused on addressing threats to democratic institutions and norms, enhancing justice and accountability in conflict and post-conflict environments, and improving security forces respect for human rights. Prior to joining CSIS, Shannon was the Senior Director for Global Engagement on the National Security Council. In that role, she developed and coordinated policies and initiatives to deepen and broaden U.S. government uh, engagement with critical population overseas, including spearheading President Obama, stand with civil society agenda, and young leader initiative around the world. She also served at the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development for over a decade. Andrea Prasso is Deputy Washington Director at the Human Rights Watch, where she conducts advocacy before the U.S. government on global human rights issues. While at the Human Rights Watch, she has researched and analyzed U.S. national security policy and practices and has led advocacy efforts urging executive and legislative branch officials in Washington to implement national security policy that respect internationally recognized rights. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, Andrea was a defense attorney with the Office of Military Commissions. She served as assistant counsel for Salim Hamdan in the only contested military commission trial to date. Andrea also served as Hepia's counsel for 10 Saudi detainees at Guantanamo. With that, without further, further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest to the stage. Fanula, that was an excellent keynote presentation. You framed the issue so nicely. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us both in person and online. We're going to jump right in. Lana, yes. Fanula highlighted the importance of today's report. You talked about the importance of having an evidence-based report looking at counterterrorism measures and civil society. Share with us some of the key findings and recommendations from the report. Well, thank you very much. Um, in May last year, we embarked on this endeavor uh, to examine the impact of counterterrorism laws and practices on this space for civil society as part of our work on how best to address the trend of closing civic space. 
we wanted to develop an empirical evidence beyond the anecdotal um, one of the use of counterterrorism measures as an inconvenient justification to close civic space. Considering the complex global landscape of counterterrorism and protecting national security, we selected a series of five case studies. Uh, we, as me and Shannon and myself, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we we selected Australia, Bahrain, Burkina Faso, Hungary, and India. That represent the various contexts surrounding security and civil uh, civil society. Each case study highlights a different set of threat to civic space, stemming from concern about national security and terrorism. So the Australia case is a classic example of a government adopting far-reaching and exceptional counterterrorism powers that could impact civil society and the enjoyment of a human rights at large if they are misused. The Bahrain case is another classic example where it demonstrates how vaguely defined, uh, uh, defined and politically motivated counterterrorism laws and other restrictive measures are used to silence uh, dissent voices in, in particularly Bahrain, uh, civil so space for civil society is effectively closed. Burkina Faso, on the other hand, illustrates the challenge that civil society face, uh, faces in the absence of effective public institutions and strong judiciary while the threat of terrorism looms. The cases of Hungary and India are different in that the threat of terrorism have been overblown by nationalist leaders to justify a crackdown on civil society and to close civic space using the, like the migration crisis um, um, to close civic space or to use a uh, label of anti-development, anti-national to close civic space. We identify the following trends in, in our reports. States have purposely or unknowingly conflated terrorism with broader perceived or alleged national secu security threats. The blurriness between these two threats is due to the lack of an internationally agreed upon definition of terrorism and countries' willful distortion of threat to serve uh, their political agenda as Fanola just uh, noted. Level of political will vary from country to another. At the low end of the spectrum, government uh, intentionally use counterterrorism measures to crack down on civil society. At the other end are uh, countries that are more committed to human rights and civil liberties. Similarly, the level of strategy and capacity um, differ from country to another. At the low end of the spectrum are states that lack the strategy, the implementation, or inform, enforcement capacity to execute counterterrorism strategies that protect a human rights and civic space. On the other end are countries that have high governmental capacity and have adopted a human rights-based approach to counterterrorism. The report sets uh, of recommendation propose a more comprehensive um, process that government, civil society, and the international community should undertake to change the political will and find the way. These recommendations are context targeted based on the level of the political will and of the capacity in adopting a counterterrorism strategy and policy that align security and civic space. So we said this, the following recommendation, and I encourage you to read it because we did it in more of targeted context, just to measure the level of political will. So you'll see our recommendation are more um, leading to a, where's the context of a country, if it is of a high political will or low will, similarly, if high capacity or low capacity. For governments, uh, we, Gov to governments, we recommended to undertake legal reform. Governments should undertake efforts to review domestic counterterrorism legislation to ensure that the definition of terrorist acts are not really crafted, covering only conduct that is genuinely of a terrorist nature. Establish a national independent review mechanism. Government should establish independent mechanisms for regular review of 
uh, operation of national counterterrorism laws and practices and their compliance with international standards. Build and deepen partnership with civil society. Government should always solicit input on counterterrorism laws development, revisions from a wide range of civil society groups and actors, similarly to what just mentioned by Fanola, to see civil society are as a partner, not as enemy. To the international community, link security assistance with civic space, condition weapons and arms sales with what often civic space and human rights protection. Establish a comprehensive framework that incorporates the assessment of a human rights violation and civil society restriction that in turn affect the amount of security sector assistance provided. Partner with local civil society organization to incorporate a greater focus on democracy, governance, rule of law, and security assistance programming. To civil society, we recommended that civil society document measures and practices that violate human rights and restrict civil society. Such documentation must be impartial and detailed to accurately reflect the situation on the ground to the international community. Build networks and coalition of diverse actor. Civil society must build effective partnerships with stakeholders outside of their typical network. Use the space offered by multilateral organization effectively. CSOs must band together in order to present a collective, unified voice at public forum. To multilateral organization, we recommend that they consult with civil society representative on global measures and strategies to combat terrorism. This required the revision of the Economic and Social Council NGO Committee civil society accreditation process to ensure CSOs access and participation in, uh, in this dialogue. Harmonize strategy and review processes. Uh, multilateral organization have the opportunity to bring countries together to synchronize and review these strategies, highlight areas for cooperation, exchange experiences on striking the right balance between countering terrorism and protecting human rights and protecting civic space. For the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force, we recommended as well to establish a legal review mechanism that would conduct a regular review of country counterterrorism laws to ensure consistency with their international human rights obligation, include freedom of expression, of association, and um, of peaceful assembly. Similar to the UPR uh, mechanism, the Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review. Finally, for the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, uh, we recommended the establishment of an internationally agreed upon definition for terrorism using the legal review mechanism oversee the revision of national legislation to ensure that new laws and approaches reflect the agreed upon definition. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lana. And I appreciate the fact that the report doesn't <laughs> simply admire the problem, but actually makes practical recommendations. You'll see the recommendations in the report but it's everything from recommendations to civil society as well as to the global architecture for counterterrorism. I'm sure Fanula has suggestions around that as well. But Shannon, I'd like to basically delve down on one particular topic. You know a lot about the issue of counterterrorism in civic space. In fact, I think you were the first government official who actually really got it. We went to you some years ago, and if it weren't for you, I don't think we would have had some of the progress we've had. But now you work for the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Mm -hmm. Can you address that particular issue, which is how do counterterrorism measures affecting civil society impact humanitarian organizations, peace building organizations, development organizations in fragile and conflict situations? Great, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and thanks to CSIS for convening us around this important topic. Um, first, a quick disclaimer, I'm not representing my current organization, Civic, in my remarks, as the topic of today's conversation, I think, goes beyond our mission. However, I will be drawing on my experience researching this topic here at CSIS. As Doug mentioned, having numerous conversations while I was at the White House, really trying to understand how counterterrorism approaches and measures were affecting civil society 
and frankly affecting the U.S. government's strategic interest in making sure that we're addressing development and humanitarian needs, and then of course my current role at Civic. Um, and I like the way that you framed this question, Doug, because I think oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, when we talk about counterterrorism and its impact on civil society, we often talk about the impact on civil society organizations, um, meaning sort of well-defined and structured organizations. We also often talk about the impact on the sector. And I think all of those things are really important, but when we talk about it in those terms, it can tend to sort of sanitize the conversation or make it a um, technical conversation. And it allows us to lose sight of why this topic really matters. And that is because oftentimes these measures have very real world and devastating impact on people who are oftentimes the most vulnerable and are in need of the services that civil society offers. So all around the world, as we're all aware, um, particularly in fragile countries where the government often does not have the will, capacity, or reach to meet the needs of its citizens, civil society often acts as a gap filler or a lifeline to civilians, providing essential services that nobody else is able to provide. So when these counterterrorism measures that we've all been talking about impact the ability of humanitarian organizations, development organizations, or peace building organizations to access those areas and offer that help, it has very concrete effects on people's ability to get clean water, their ability to get enough food to feed their families and keep them well nourished, to access life-saving medicines. So I think it's important for us to take a moment and think about not just the impact that counterterrorism, or really the counterterrorism regime or architecture has on civil society organizations per se, but the impact that it has on civilians, real people. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to talk about a couple of the different ways or sort of mechanisms that counterterrorism measures have had this impact. Um, as Fanola mentioned, following 9-11, there was a flurry of activity at the Security Council and elsewhere to figure out ways to prevent terrorism. And a lot of that um, was meant to close very legitimate gaps in the architecture. One of the streams of effort was um, on financing terrorism and trying to make sure that money was not getting into the hands of terrorists. And there were very legitimate measures that were put in place to prevent the transfer of funds to terrorist organizations. However, those legitimate measures, um, as they have played out and as the years have gone on and institutions have been built up and national legislation has been developed and the global financial architecture has caught up to all of this, all of these things have proven debilitating, frankly, for the ability of organizations, particularly humanitarian and development organizations, who are operating in these high-risk or fragile environments to serve the populations in areas where terrorist groups or extremist groups are present. International banks are scared of running afoul of these um, counterterrorism laws. And as a result, they've closed accounts of organizations that they're concerned or wary of. They've blocked or delayed um, funding transfers to organizations um, that are working in some of these areas. And this has prevented a lot of international and local organizations from operating at their full capacity. Sometimes it prevented them from operating at all. A year ago, when I was still at CSIS, we hosted an event with the Charity and Security Network, and they were presenting their report, which was basically the first ever comprehensive survey of US-based nonprofit organizations. And it was asking those organizations, what challenges do they face um, accessing financial services in the work that they were doing internationally? And we all knew that this was gonna be a problem, particularly for organizations operating in those fragile high-risk environments. But what was stunning about that survey is they found that two-thirds of the organizations that responded said that they had faced some difficulties in financial access, including delays in wire transfers, 
requests for lots of onerous paperwork um, and documentation, increased fees in order to get money to where it needed to go, account closures and account refusals. And again, coming back to my earlier remarks, these challenges have had real world consequences in civilians' lives. So one of the um, examples that this report offered was of a nonprofit being prevented from sending immediate relief to the persecuted Rohingya minority in Myanmar in the midst of a dire humanitarian crisis. They suggest that the, time, the lack of timely transmittal of, fundings, of funding might have actually prevented the organization from saving lives. Another prominent example that you often hear in the context is of Somalia, and a lot of humanitarian organizations came to us when I was at the White House to talk about um, the difficulties they were having in Somalia because when the United States listed al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization in 2008, the flow of aid funding became much more difficult, and there's actually been documentation showing that it decreased by 88%. Again, because organizations were concerned about running afoul of US counterterrorism laws. The loss of this aid was particularly devastating in the 2010 to 2012 period when Somalia was experiencing a severe famine. So here you have a situation where humanitarian organizations are stuck between their need to, of course, comply with law and not wanting to get caught up in a sort of legal action and wanting to serve people who were starving um, and who were in a very difficult situation and were inaccessible. I think I need to move on quickly. Um, the second issue, and this is certainly related, is about material support concerns. So another thing that these counterterrorism laws have done is criminalize material support to terrorist organizations, not only including the provision of funds, but also um, providing property, technical assistance, food, anything that could be considered support to terrorist organizations. So what you have is a situation where these organizations often control large swaths of territory, and they might charge an organization that wants to operate in that space a fee for entry. Um, they might impose taxes on their operations and other ways that they might try to shave off funding for the organization. And of course, because those organizations can't provide that kind of support to a terrorist organization, this directly impacts the ability to operate in those spaces and provide relief to people who are living in places controlled by terrorist organizations. So activities such as building and operating hospitals, setting up refugee camps, distributing food, water, and medicine could all constitute providing material support to a terrorist organization if that terrorist organization is on the list. So Doug's organization, ICNL, published a terrific report on the impact of counterterrorism on development and humanitarian organizations. And it cites an example in Syria where several British CSOs reported that they had to suspend humanitarian and development operations in areas where the Islamic State and other terrorist groups are present, not out of fear of their personal safety, but from fear of prosecution under the United Kingdom's counterterrorism laws. One such CSO that they cite in this report, the London-based Human Care Syria, was unable to carry out its mission of delivering water filters in communities in northeast Syria that lacked access to clean water until it found a route that ensured no contact with ISIS or other prescribed groups. This also affects peacebuilding organizations that operate on a business model where they need to be able to talk and engage with multiple sides of a, con of a conflict. And oftentimes because of these material support considerations, peacebuilding organizations are becoming more risk averse, concerned that their engagement with terrorist organizations um, could jeopardize their reputation or get them in legal trouble, and therefore they're staying away from that. Um, so all of this, of course, again, puts communities and civilians in a situation where they're really vulnerable and sort of left out um, because they're being squeezed between the counterterrorism regime um, and the actors that are doing them harm. So finally, um, in terms of the direct impact, I do want to talk about the direct impact that counterterrorism operations have on civilians. Um, countries that are facing terrorist violence obviously have a legitimate reason to want to do everything that they can to stamp out 
the, that violence and to protect their population. In fact, they have an obligation to do so. The problem is that oftentimes the approach they take ends up harming civilians. So one of the strategies of terrorist organizations is that they embed themselves with communities, but that makes it difficult for governments to distinguish civilians from terrorists. And rather than taking the time and making the effort to make that differentiation, which they are obligated to do, some governments have basically just determined that entire areas are hostile. Um, or make assumptions that just because somebody is of a certain age or belongs to a certain tribe or is still in that area when others have fled, that that means that they necessarily are terrorists or are supporting the terrorist organization and therefore are a legitimate target. Um, as a result, as we're all aware, security forces have committed horrible atrocities against civilians. Um, I'll give you one anecdote because I think I'm out of time. Um, in Egypt, for example, the Sisi regime's campaign against ISIS in the North Sinai has used a blunt force approach to counterterrorism. Indiscriminate bombings, extrajudicial ki killings, raising of entire villages um, in a way that has really harmed civilians who are caught in this situation. An anecdote that has been making the rounds in Washington involves a training exercise, supposedly, that was held in a mock village where an Egyptian soldier came under attack. After returning fire, the soldier's next course of action was to call in airstrikes. When the US um, trainers that were participating in that exercise questioned why you would call in an airstrike on an entire village, the soldier merely shrugged his shoulders and said, villagers were probably guilty anyway. And that sort of, I think, is a good illustration of the challenge. Um, oftentimes when governments see civilians as part of the problem um, and take a counterterrorism approach that addresses everyone as if they are part of this terrorism problem. Um, and as my colleagues have mentioned, this is very counterproductive in that we know that when there is this heavy-handed, brutal approach to terrorism, that oftentimes it breeds the very kind of resentments and grievances that then fuel the cycle of terrorism. So, Shannon, thank you for sharing those really compelling examples. And I think it's important because sometimes it's possible to talk about these issues only as if they affect policy. And what you illustrate is how it affects people. And I see a lot of people nodding their heads as Shannon is speaking. You'll have a chance to ask questions, so please jot down those questions, remember them. But before we do, I actually want to turn to Andrea. Uh, Shannon, you talked about the impact and legacy of September 11th. And paraphrasing Lenin, sometimes decades pass and nothing happens. And sometimes days pass and decades happen. Andrea, you've had an opportunity for some time to engage with the US government on issues of human rights and counterterrorism. Share with us your experience and how that shifting based not only on the developments in the last week or so, but also in sort of the last year or two. Thanks, Doug, and, and thank you to CSIS in particular for having a panel with so many accomplished women, which is really nice to see. Those of you who work in the national security realm will not be surprised to hear that days, if not weeks, can go by where I'm the only woman in the room <laughs> discussing national security. So uh, it's really nice to see. So as you alluded to, Doug, I had, um, you know, we've known about this panel for some time. I was thinking about my remarks, had, had some set thoughts. And, uh, and then last week, when the president announced his intent to nominate Mike Pompeo, current CIA director to be Secretary of State and the current deputy, Gina Haspel, to be director of the CIA. Um, that has really brought to the fore some of these issues that, that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments and I see some real experts in the room already, so I'm, I'm eager to have some people contribute. So uh, I'll return to Pompeo and Haspel in a moment. I have worked in this area for some time. Um, I see a, a colleague from law school in the room here, actually, and I was in law school on 9-11, and my career path uh, really diverted then. I had a different plan, but anyway, <laughs> here I am, and it's been very interesting and challenging. Um, and these challenges are not limited to, uh, they're not partisan, they're not limited to who is in power, um, but they do 
present differently under different approaches. So under the Obama administration, Obama was very uh, bold and made very helpful remarks about the so-called false choice between human rights and countering terrorism. Uh, that may not have always played out in practice, but the rhetoric around it was incredibly powerful. It was very important to hear time and time again that it is a false choice, and we've heard not only is it a false choice, it's actually counterproductive, and I think some of the research bears that out. Of course, it's quite challenging to actually demonstrate that when it comes to research, so um, that's one of the challenges those of us on sort of the policy recommendation side have. People will say, well, can you show me that X number of people joined ISIS or joined Al-Qaeda after a certain drone strike? And that type of research is just incredibly challenging, if not actually impossible, to conduct. But I think over the years, we've seen that, in fact, the failure to respect human rights uh, and, in fact, the failure to prioritize human rights is counterproductive in a number of ways, including making people feel more vulnerable, more interested in finding alternative approaches to ha hearing their voices, having their voices heard, uh, including by joining terrorist groups and, and feeling really disengaged from, from the state. So that rhetoric was incredibly important. Um, today, of course, we hear a very different type of rhetoric from the Trump administration. And again, prior to last Tuesday, um, we hadn't, so the president, uh, when he was a candidate, talked about supporting torture, but was also very clear that he would defer to Secretary Mattis' assessment that torture would not be used and was ineffective. And in terms of a sort of practical approach, it was off the table. Um, last week, with the nomination of, uh, of, or the announced nomination of Pompeo and Haspel, a lot of that changed. And just in terms of uh, procedurally, as of yesterday, Pompeo was actually nominated. His nomination was transmitted. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, Haspel was not. So I don't know if that, that is forthcoming or not. Um, but, but these announcements really bring to the fore this notion that, um, that it's not a false choice, that in fact, the administration's approach may be one that human rights need to be you know, sacrificed in exchange for national security, in, ex in exchange for countering terrorism. Every society thinks torture is abhorrent, but maybe torture will work this time. Uh, you know, that, that sort of rhetoric that I think we're going to see more and more of now. Um, what I hope we'll see, though, is a strong resistance to that rhetoric. One of the things we're doing as an institution at Human Rights Watch is trying to cull together all of the information to present to relevant policymakers so that the Senate can really take up its role of rigorously testing candidates on their human rights record. Um, Pompeo, uh, the nomination to be the top diplomat, the, the Secretary of State really is the face of the United States. It's not the President, even though he's on TV and he's broadcast everywhere. The Se Secretary of State and the people who work for him or her are the ones who are in every country around the world doing outreach not only to their counterparts and governments, but directly to civil society organizations, or at least they should be. In this administration, we've seen very little outreach to civil society organizations. So I think that role, um, that's why it's so important that even some of the Democrats who voted to confirm Pompeo as CIA director have said that they are open to looking rigorously at his record when it comes to Secretary of State. So I think that's going to be a really key moment for this administration, and not just the administration, but, but getting a sense of how the US government as a whole will respond to these issues, because uh, of course, the administration is, is the administration, the head of the executive branch, but it's not the US government. And I see people here who work even in the executive branch and have worked in the executive branch who know that even then, um, you know, the Secretary of State or, or, and the, the top people in any particular branch of the government are not the whole of government. Um, my concern is that if you have someone in power who has espoused views that are antithetical to human rights, that the people below him will not be able to effectuate the really good programming that the US government has worked on over the years. And in fact, by uh, nominating someone who was at the CIA to be Secretary of State, that nomination in and of itself may be incredibly counterproductive because again, those of you who've worked for the US government know that pretty much anywhere in the world, I mean, even I experienced this working for an NGO, that people believe you work for the CIA. And to put the head of the CIA as the head of the State Department, you know, all of this outreach, it's just, it's falling apart around the world. People feel like it's been confirmed that anyone who works for USAID, who, you know, humanitarian organizations that have headquarters in the US, human rights organizations like mine that has a headquarters in the US, that it's confirmed that in fact we all work for the CIA. We don't. 
Uh, but I think that's an incredible, <laughs> incredible challenge that civil society organizations are going to face. So the Trump administration has not been uh, forward-leaning at all on human rights, but there are two areas where they have identified human rights as a priority. One is the protection of religious minorities, particularly Christians, and the other is uh, defending American citizens detained abroad. And I think those areas will continue to remain a priority and do still present a couple of areas where we may be able to amplify that forward-looking approach to human rights. Uh, and with respect to counterterrorism, I think the, uh, the focus on religious minorities is one of the areas where people like myself who work in advocacy and, and try to urge policymakers um, to take a certain approach can use that. So the administration is focused on protecting the rights of religious minorities. Often, counterterrorism measures have the opposite effect. And I think the more we're able to demonstrate that, that a particular counterterrorism measure, which I may say is problematic from a human rights perspective, is also problematic from the perspective of protecting <coughs> religious minorities, that may be a way that we can get the Trump administration to, to see some of the challenges there. Um, and again, American citizens detained abroad um, have been and likely will continue to be swept up in some of these counterterrorism measures. And again, that's an area where, although the administration's focus is on those American citizens and getting them released, it's an opportunity for others to pivot to the broader issues. Why would someone be swept up? Why didn't they have the right to challenge their detention? And so on. So there are some areas of opportunity there. Um, but again, particularly if, if Pompeo is confirmed, you know, he has made public remarks before and since he was confirmed as CIA director that are anti-woman, anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, um, really calling into question how the State Department will be able to support not only civil society, but its own employees, its own personnel around the world. Um, so we have a lot of concerns about that. The other area, um, which I'm just gonna flag, and I know I see a real expert here who maybe will comment, is his, uh, his thoughts on privacy and, and mass surveillance. And that's uh, incredibly troubling when it comes to civil society organizations because when they feel or are in fact um, under constant surveillance by their own government or by other governments, it, the chilling effect is, is incredibly broad. And I think the un, unstated assumption here today, which we all share, is that we need and, and value these robust civil society organizations as well as having the individuals that Shannon talked about feel supported and feel empowered and if they feel that they, and in fact are, being monitored and information about them is being shared, whether it's for counterterrorism or other reasons, the chilling effect is incredibly broad um, to say nothing, of course, of the individual violation that, that they experience in those circumstances. So I'm going to stop there because I'm really hoping to take some questions and comments. Thank you, Andrea, that was great. And Benula, the last word to you before we go to the audience. And I was wondering if you could actually bring in the perspective of some of the governments in international organizations that you deal with. That if you look around the room, I think if we work for civil society or we've studied human rights, we agree it's a false choice between human rights and counterterrorism. Yet if you're talking to someone in government whose sole job it is to try to counterterrorism, preserve national security, they say we don't get credit for all the human rights stuff that might flow from this. We really have to focus on countering terrorism. How do you address that? What kind of arguments do you use? What kinds of arguments should we be using to show that in fact it's not a false choice? I mean, one is to state the obvious that we don't have monolithic governments or monolithic perspectives from governments and my engagement is bilateral but also we have groups. So for example, the European Union tends to march and step as a group, so sometimes there are opportunities to work with groups of states. And I think the first thing is often for, for human rights advocates to cons continue to insist that security is a human right. I don't think we say that often enough. I grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, so um, I understand what it feels like to be afraid. Uh, I understand what it looks like to run when a bomb goes off. So I do think that as human rights activists, we sometimes do not sufficiently articulate the necessity that security is a value and a human right too. And so I think we start, and I think when you can acknowledge that to a government, a government actually sees that you understand one of the starting positions that they start from. And I think that's a really important place to start. And I think the second place to start, often for me, increasingly for me, 
is around this issue of self-interest and pragmatism. And here I will say that we increasingly do have studies that are starting to show this sort of, that to close the information gap for governments. So I'm going to reference one which was produced earlier this year, which is a study by UNDP on parts, uh, paths to radicalization in Africa. And it looks literally at the pathways of individuals and how they ended up in radical groups and really does, and it's a broad and, and, and um, an embracive study that allows us to actually draw some really concrete empirical conclusions for states. I actually think as NGOs, but also as social scientists, as policymakers, we have to encourage more good data in counterterrorism. As a social scientist now, policymaker in part, I would say one of the things that, that sort of plagues our, our, our engagement here is a lack of good data and a lot of really bad data, actually. People who woke up and wrote that book on jihad in the morning and that becomes what's cited somewhere. So I do think <laughs> an evidence-based approach to counterterrorism and talking to governments around evidence is really important and encouraging them to seek their own evidence. Um, the third is really this real emphasizing this link between preventing long-term strategic prevention of terrorism and the long-term interests of the state. And here we have emerging discourses in the area of preventing and countering violent extremism that I think are really helpful. They have their problems, they have been misused by states, but that actually takes us into an area when we can start to talk in a, in a, in a robust and, and self-interested way with governments about prevention and that, I think, is a really fruitful space for us all to be, both as human rights. And in that space, civil society and citizens are the government's allies and partners. And they, if we can get that across, I think we would do really well. And the final thing I would say is I do think we have to be prepared to call out when governments do things well. I find that as a policymaker, it's actually when you go in and lecture states and there are people here who've served in government, it's not very productive when somebody tells you what you're doing wrong all the time. <laughs> and I do think we have to get very good at telling folks what they're doing well, even if it's not perfect. Perfect is sometimes the enemy of the good. Um, but also, um, and when we do that, then we create a space to legitimately call out governments when they don't. I sometimes think we don't do enough of the former to show governments that we will, in fact, acknowledge and reward them for hard work in this space. So, I mean, that's part of my own approach to dialogue with governments, and I find some mixture of all of that, depending on the government, works. <laughs> well, thank you for those very constructive suggestions. We're now going to turn to the audience, and what I'd ask is that you identify yourself. There are roving mics, so you can ask a question. Let's make sure it's also a question. For me, the litmus test is if it takes you more than a minute, it's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have colleagues with microphones, maybe we'll start from the front and move to the back. We have colleagues in the second row. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of an organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts, violence, and now counterterrorism. Thank you so much. I want to thank CSA for involving civil society. Nobody thinks of us, and if there's anything people hate in this world, is civil society. They don't want to hear, especially government, they don't want to hear, because they say you are spying them, you are doing this, everything and all the names. So thank you so much for, even the World Bank, I attend World Bank meetings as a civil society, United Nations, but who are we? How do we really civil society get on the table, they are not under the table, to hear what they are saying and how we can in be involved? Because civil society have become victims. They are beaten to death, they are jailed, and they go to hospital, nobody supports them, they have no money, they have nothing to help them. So how do we make this uh, initiative work and advocacy for the civil society, especially in Africa? I come from Kenya where we have uh, Terrorism is all over the world now. It's every, even here we are seeing it every day we read it. So how do we engage uh, civil society more, and especially the young people who are recruited by these people, the terrorists, uh, because they don't have food, they, the family, they to help their family, and then they go to terrorism. So how do we partner, and how do we sit on the table, and how will can the civil society get support as financial support to help 
the needs of uh, this advocacy. So thank you so much, CSI, for remembering civil society. Thank you. Thank you. What we'll do is we'll take three questions and then turn to the panel. <coughs> and why don't we turn to this colleague in the first row, and then we'll move back and we'll jump around. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mehreen Farouk. I'm the uh, Peace and Security Director at Counterpart International. So I first of all want to commend you all on a really timely and excellent report. I look forward to reading all the recommendations. Um, so I recently just came back from Niger last week where we've been developing a program to strengthen participatory governance with also um, some focus on security governance. And so what we found there is particularly in the south bordering Nigeria, there are a lot of communities that are very concerned about terrorism, they're concerned about recruitment, um, but they're also concerned about their daily lives being disrupted by emergency laws. And a large part of the, I think, trust gap that's between civil society and the security sector is a breakdown in communication. So one of the things that we're trying to do is empower journalists and also build up the capacity of the security sector to better communicate information to the communities so that you know, they understand that we're setting up this, this roadblock, we're gonna have this emergency law in place, this is how it's going to impact you. So my question really is, is you know, I think we've done a really great job of highlighting the threats, the negative impacts of counterterrorism on civil society, but you know, how do we shift that paradigm so that uh, folks from the civil society sector aren't really seen from this victim mentality, but rather as empowered stakeholders that can actively positively shape and inform um, our counterterrorism responses. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll take one more question. This colleague in the third row, please. Hello, I'm Stacy Shamber from ICANN, the International Civil Society Action Network. Thank you very much for your remarks and this report. Uh, I very much look forward to reading it. And I just wanted to ask your opinion about technology uh, and the role of that in counterterrorism and, and civil society. I think we can recognize ways in which civil society organizations harness the power of technology to further their missions, but um, we are seeing increasing risk um, as well in terms of the use of technology and, and counterterrorism. So any thoughts on that uh, from your research? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And now to the panel. So I'll um, try to pick up on the first and second question because I think they're tied together, which is actually about civil society playing a constructive and collaborative role in addressing both the underlying causes of violent extremism and terrorism, as well as sort of the, me the immediate manifestations. So on the first, and to something that Fonula said, when I did the Australia case study, it was really evident that the government had sort of blocked any engagement with civil society on their counterterrorism legislation because there had been this sort of insidious cycle of negative engagement between the government and civil society organizations where the government felt like all the organizations ever did was sort of complain and critique and criticize them, but they never had anything constructive to offer. So it got to the point where they were really jamming through legislation that had serious impacts on civil society without ever having consulted with civil society. Um, and so I think to your point about really needing to start from the premise that nobody wants there to be terrorist attacks in a country. That is both an interest of civil society, and I mean civil society in the broadest sense, as well as the government, and really trying to figure out in their engagement with government how to be constructive and how to say, okay, you have not only an interest but an obligation in making sure that you're protecting the citizens of that country. Like, we get it, we're on the same page, but the way that you're trying to do this is you know, overly broad, it's not targeted enough. What about taking this kind of approach and really working with the government on finding avenues that are more um, proportional to the threat, more targeted, more tailored, um, and doing so in a way that is timely um, from the beginning of any consideration about new measures. That's the first thing. Um, on the second thing, I totally agree with you, and actually a couple weeks ago, I was in Northeast Nigeria, and one of the things that you found is 
several years ago when the government had this much more sort of blunt force approach to dealing with Boko Haram, it was not only alienating the population in the Northeast, but it was contributing to more brutal tactics by Boko Haram. So there was this like horrible downward spiral of violence with civilians caught in the middle. When these civilian um, militias, these community militias started to emerge and the individuals in the communities felt like they could use those community militias as a bridge to the security forces and they started engaging in dialogue, there has been a quantitative decrease in the amount of civilian casualties, harm, um, and deaths that have happened in the Northeast. It's not perfect, but those kinds of dialogues and having security forces understand how their actions are contributing to harm and how better to protect civilians, and then winning the trust so that civilians are then providing information back to the security forces about what they're seeing has had a significant positive impact in reducing violence. Um, just to add to this, back to the point of the civil society engagement, and this is one of the recommendations that's highlighted in our report, is that civil society needs to, to come with a unified approach and really to, to have a collective voice. This is something as well, and to bring this collective voice as well to the um, global structure, global counterterrorism structure. Mm -hmm given that there are limited opportunity for civil society to, because of the ECOSOC accreditation, this is probably uh, an, a task on the side of civil society is to bring um, these, co uh, these voices collectively and to bring it out to the global structure. Um, on the point of the communication journals, this is where we find it as well for, for an area and particularly in the Middle East and North Africa where journalists, they don't have the voice. Um, and if they have the voice, uh, they would be um, distorted voices. So I think it's an important initiative that they're coming in terms of bringing, seeing the voices of journalists not as an independent and impartial voices. That would be important to bring these two, um, two, uh, two communities together, not to work in silos. Yes, yeah, so to respond to the question about you know how does civil society become involved, I, I do think we have to disaggregate that from different spaces. So clearly at the global level, there is, I think, an extraordinary need to create um, formal spaces for civil society engagement within the global counterterrorism architecture. Because the formation of policy that then goes on to shape national laws and practices is happening at the global level without very little input. And so actually then organizations like Human Rights Watch, others, are actually dealing with the downstream effects. We're not actually dealing with the issues at source. And there I think there's a really huge gap. It's been overlooked by many organizations. There hasn't been a consolidated approach. And this is actually a very important time because the global arc counterterrorism architecture is in flux. A new Office of Counterterrorism was created at the UN in uh, last year uh, with a new Under Secretary General. It's trying to figure out what its space is. So there's a lot of moving pieces, believe it or not, in the furniture of the global counterterrorism architecture right now, at least at the UN level. That is a really, if, if organizations and global civil society, particularly INGOs, could move quickly and in concert, I think there are some spaces that could be negotiated there, and that would be important to shaping the kinds of policies that come out. I think that's also true at the regional level. For example, there's a very good report by the uh, EU in the last six months looking at the lack of human rights imprint on the EU counterterrorism structure, a, a lack of formal space within the EU's own architecture. Again, I think region by region, we have to look at where those spaces exist, whether it's Latin America, the African Union, trying to figure out again, how do we create those institutional spaces? Your question, of course, then brings us to the national level, which is often the most difficult level, because we have two phenomena coming together, I think, well described in this report. One is the sort of counter-terrorism regulation, whether it's financing or other kinds of constraints or direct targeting. But the second is a broader anti-democratic shutdown of civil society space focused on funding, how organizations get their funding, limits on external funding, 
membership criteria, all kinds of registration requirements, some of which are entirely unrelated to counterterrorism, but bolted together with terrorism are having an outsize effect on civil society. And there, I think, we need a strategy to understand, and I think this report starts a very important conversation of how we disaggregate the effects of both of those things at the national level. And how, for me, I think, and I uh, think of, how do we create cross-national networks to support smaller organizations in their national settings? ICANN does some of that work. FIDH does some of that work. There are lots of, but I think thinking about you know, networks of support across countries, particularly for those NGOs working in the most fragile and the most ill-supported circumstances, what are the kinds of support systems that can be put in place and how can we amplify the, the, their voices? The final space that I think is a very under-recognized space is what I would like to think of as they're global quangos. They don't really sit in the UN architecture. They don't sit in any regional architecture. We were having a discussion about them earlier about entities like FATF, the uh, Global Counterterrorism Forum. These are spaces that look kind of, um, well, first of all, we don't know very much about them. And second of all, quite a lot of work gets done in these spaces that have an outsized effect on civil society because states are deliberately avoiding the structures of the UN or the EU to do their counterterrorism work in those spaces. And I think we have to watch where the action is happening and be much more, that much more attuned to where the work is being done. Um, let me just finally, so that's on how we engage civil society. I do think this question of technology is a really important one. Um, I will say that I think there's an enormous gap between a focus on technology as a carrier of terrorism and a lot of regulation happening nationally and internationally. So, for example, airline passenger information, which I now know more about than I ever want to know about, but I, <laughs> and I did not know about that a year ago. But areas like um, the internet regulation and um, global biometric systems. So on the one hand, we're having extraordinary regulation of technology and technology interface with terrorism. But let's be clear, there are parts of the globe where the inter we don't have, in and let's look at how much internet connectivity we have in some of the societies that are most affected by terrorism. Actually, it's very low. And there, we have a problem with radios and the kind of propaganda or information. So in this area of technology, I think there's a sense from westernized states in particular that technology regulation is absolutely critical to addressing terrorism. That uh, that brings in privacy and other concerns. In other parts of the globe, the challenge is the technology isn't available, and you have much less high-tech forms of both challenge and regulation. And I don't think we've put those two things together very much, or the human rights implications of what it means to straddle both of them. So, so these are fascinating points, and I know that there are a lot of questions. I hope that some of our panelists will be able to stay after the close of the session, so if you don't get a chance to get your question answered during the formal session, please stay afterwards. But let's take a couple more questions. We've taken from the left and the right. Let's go to the back benchers. Any questions in the back? Please, sir. Hi, my name is Chris Schrock from Ohio Valley University. Um, I, I'm a philosopher. I, I want to ask it more of a, a conceptual question. Um, my, uh, um, so, so I've been listening to the conversation uh, very closely, and I, and I think the case has been made very well for, uh, for two things. One, that, uh, uh, that having security and having anti-terrorism measures uh, is really good for civil society, and then also that attacks on civil society um, have a tendency to breed terrorism. Both of those seem, I mean, tremendously plausible and, uh, and, and well evidenced. Um, but, the, uh, but the conceptual question I want to ask is, is about the, uh, um, whether or not there is this trade-off um, either um, among different, uh, different civil goods or between uh, uh, some sort of security and, and the other civil goods that we might talk about. Um, I think that it you know, an answer to this started to be formulated with the, uh, with the response just a minute ago with the technology issue, but, uh, but I, I still wanted to point out in the, in the conversation there, there was uh, 
some discussion of, of the use of blunt force uh, in response to terrorists. Uh, that, that term suggests that what you need is more precision and probably therefore more, more effort, resources devoted to it. Makes it sound like there are limited resources to address and support all these, these different things. That makes it sound like there is in fact a trade-off. Um, also in the, uh, in the document that we got, um, page 75 talks about striking a balance um, among these things as if uh, uh, as if they're not always cooperative, but that um, resources to support one or the other have to be distributed carefully. And so I just wanted to ask about some conceptual clarification there. Thanks. Great, thanks. We'll take two more questions. Anybody in the middle? Our silent centrists. No? Sir. Hello, Jack Gaines from Albany Associates International. Uh, you brought up an excellent point about the um, civil society needing to project into the future and advocate for the long-term end of terrorism with those countries. I would love to hear more about how you, you could see the different CSOs working in that sphere, as well as um, another brilliant comment, which is the advocacy of the larger network groups like ICANN, um, supporting the on-ground folks who are suffering so much It'd be great to figure out if we can have a better policy to on ground advocacy process. Thank you. Thank you. And the final question, please. What was that? Is, is it for you to stand? Oh, sure. <laughs> Hi, Liza Goitin from the Brennan Center for Justice. This was wonderful and fascinating. And I kept thinking about. Um, the response that I sometimes hear from people in this country when we hear about other countries that are using the terrorist framework to crack down on dissent within those countries. And you know, what, what I can imagine those same people saying to this report is, you, know, you have to make a distinction between measures that are genuinely directed uh, to uh, counter actual terrorism that have a side effect you know, an unfortunate collateral damage kind of side effect on civil society's ability to operate, you know, maybe overseas to provide services in areas controlled by Hamas or whatever the case may be, versus countries that are using terrorism as a pretext for the purpose of cracking down on civil society. And I guess my question is, is that distinction real? What would be your answer to that? Is that, is that first of all, is that distinction real? And second of all, does it matter? And how does it matter in terms of how we think about how to address the effect of counterterrorism policies on civil society? Great question. So I'll ask that you respond to one or more of the questions, but also any final reflections. Andrea? Thank you. Um, I'm going to respond, I think, just to the, the first question, which I think is really important about this false choice balance notion. Um, and I'll speak to that in the context specifically of torture and other forms of abuse. And I think that. I'm not sure this comment translates into all forms of counterterrorism or all counterterrorism measures, but I, I think it does here. The notion that uh, there are different societal goods, of course, is true. But I think that in the context of the way human beings are being treated, there can't be a trade-off because something is always lost. And in this context specifically, what I'm thinking about is the experience of interrogators and guards who participated in or were present during detainee abuse, and the tremendous testimony that we've heard from them. People who were told and perhaps believed that they were doing what was necessary to save lives, perhaps still believe so, still think, even if it's not true, um, that they were doing what was required of them, that was what was right, following orders, whatever the case may be. And nevertheless, we have a shocking number of people who have attempted to commit suicide because of their participation, who, who suffer every day with the knowledge that they were forced to do something that even if they believed it was ethical, at some level also felt that it was immoral. And they live with that every day. Um, when we talk about torture, we talk about it as being um, immoral, illegal, and ineffective. But of course, everyone knows that torture can be effective. Um, I'm the first one to say it would take about five minutes to get me to say anything that I might say. It also would then have me say a number of things that were not true, and that's one of the core problems with uh, abuse, that people will say anything to, to stop the abuse, um, in addition to the legal prohibitions, which I think are incredibly important. 
But, but in that element, I think it's in, it really essential that we remember the human component of this and that we are not, um, you know, policies, laws, practices, they are all implemented by humans. And Shannon did a really great job of reminding us about the people who suffer the impact, but people also have to do it. Someone has to make these decisions, they have to live with those decisions, they have to implement them, and that's where something is lost if we don't simultaneously respect human rights, including the right to security that we all want. Thank you. Nella. Yeah, just let me make a comment to trade-offs and then just a final remark about sort of long, thinking about long-term. So um, I would say that as we, even as we frame the discussion of trade-offs, um, we have to think in terms of time. And so one of the challenges when a society is faced with a threat, like a 9-11 threat, something happens, we know that the instinctive response of decision makers in that moment is calibrated in particular ways by the experience of the harm that they have immediately experienced. And the result is that particular kinds of trade-offs are made in those moments. But it's also, in that sense, we, shouldn't, we should understand the particularity of those moments and the necessity for recalibration in the aftermath of those moments. Because of course, the reality is that, that there's a continuum of time in trade-off, and that's as it should be, right? And that is why around the globe, when we look at patterns and trends in counterterrorism, we see in the best cases, often for good and understandable reasons, overreaction by states in the response to immediate threat. But then, sort of like a Sisyphean moment at the top of the hill, you hope that what happens is that states then pause and take breath and look at the response and understand that when they push that rock up the mountain again, they might do it slightly differently. And that, in a sense, to me, is the kind of place that we sit in balance and trade off. Um, but that human rights is intrinsically and absolutely at the heart of how that happens, not sitting on the sidelines. And so I, I think that's, for me, is part of the way I, I think about and hope that we might all think about how that happens. Let me just say something about trade in long term, and it was the idea of how do we manage these challenges in the long term. So one of the complications, I think, in this counterterrorism space is that the language of global counterterrorism and global threat also masks a reality that statistically, if we look at the global statistics on both the geographies where terrorism occurs and where the most harm occurs, there are five countries on the Global Counterterrorism Index who produce 78% of the violence. Now, that's an important, I don't produce that data, and I even have issues with how some of that data is counted, but what I would say to you is that tells us that we don't have a, we do have a global problem, but we have a global problem that needs to be calibrated specific to region and particular geographies. And so I have said on many occasions that I think for those countries that have an outside experience of terrorism and are also in part exporting some of those problems, we need a martial terrorism plan because we need to address the complexity of fragile states, the cycles of violence, the cycles of insecurity and poor governance that produce that statistical reality. That also says that countries in other, when you have a one-size-fits-all solution, that means that we're applying certain solutions that ought to be applied to the five countries to a range of countries who actually don't need them. And that may be slightly controversial to say because part of the way in which we frame the collective challenge of terrorism, and I don't, I absolutely accept because I grew up in one of those places that we have challenges that need to be addressed. But we also have to be really smart about how we address them and having an evidence-based approach to understanding how and where the threat emanates from and addressing those in calibrated and weighted ways is the long-term solution to addressing the challenges of terrorism. I love okay. that language. I always say we need another Geneva Convention, which could never happen. <laughs> but a Marshall Plan for terrorism is a much better way of saying it. Well, we're just about at time, but... I Lana and Shannon, final points. Um, I will be very brief. I, sh I think I will start from uh, where Fonola ends. Uh, definitely, we need to, to, to bring to the conversation that the human rights and the protec protection of civil society, as well as counterterrorism measures and e effort, are mutually reinforcing and not competing. And this is where we 
need to understand, and, and this is where their language, and we try to do throughout the reports to say, um, there are a lot of efforts taken, but in, in, in the process, so civil society and human rights become at the collateral, collateral damage, and this is not what we want. We want to have a clear, um, a clear process where counterterrorism measures and efforts really take into on board these human rights obligation that states have signed voluntarily onto it. Um, I think as well the points that raised in Fanola keynote speech that to address uh, terrorism we need to have um, a vibrant civil society as well as a healthy human rights environments. And this is where I think in the overall uh, global scene, we don't see this happening. Thank you. Great, so I'm gonna pick up where Lana left off, um, which is to say that I think that there are difficult tensions, particularly in the short term, between counterterrorism, human rights, and just the well-being of civilians. So even in the examples that I offered, I mean, it is tricky to say, okay, fine, then humanitarian organizations should be able to access those areas, even if it means paying a tax or paying a terrorist um, tariff, if you will. If it allows those terrorist groups to exist for longer, to do more damage, to terrorize civilians, to kill people, to maim, to recruit more, I mean, that is a really difficult conversation. Is the objective of saving those individuals' lives and making sure that they get this assistance worth it. Uh, you know, I think people would have very strong views about whether it's worth it if it means that the terrorist organization is going to be able to sustain itself for a little bit longer, right? I think the problem that we're all pointing out is that there's always been a knee-jerk reaction that Counterterrorism trumps all other considerations, and human rights and people's lives are subordinated to that. I think what we're saying, particularly when you're having those short-term conversations about the tensions, is that you need to have a more comprehensive view. You need to zoom out a little bit, and you need to look at human rights obligations. You need to look at the lives of those people who are caught in those circumstances. You need to look at the medium to long-term implications of the decisions that we're making and not always prejudge that counterterrorism is going to trump everything else. And then the final point, I do think it matters whether this is a side effect or sort of the intended approach because it has an impact on how you try to change the situation, right? So if it's that country just didn't have the capacity to tailor its counterterrorism legislation in a way that wouldn't harm civil society, well, that gives you something to work with, right? Like, you can have conversations, you can try to help that country revisit its counterterrorism legislation to achieve its objectives by, while making sure that it's based on risk, it's proportionate, all those kinds of things. If they're just using counterterrorism as an excuse to go after civil society, that's a political will issue, which is much more difficult. And to end on a positive note about the report that's being launched today, I think that's something that was very valuable in terms of the approach that the report took, making recommendations based on whether it was a capacity issue or a will issue or some combination thereof. Great, and in closing, a few thank yous. First. Thanks to each and every one of you. We know that your time is exceptionally busy and we appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for this discussion. Second, thanks to CSIS, not only for hosting us today, but for the terrific report that you've launched. And finally, a big thank you to our distinguished panel. It was a sophisticated and nuanced discussion. We appreciate the themes that you introduced. We look forward to continuing the discussion not only today, but in the days and weeks to follow. So in sum, thank you all. Have thank a good you. lunch. Thank you. Thank you.